in, in this context um, holds for system, assumes that the system dynamics is described by a Hamiltonian or that the system is closed. Um, there are uh, some works, and my work is um, about aspects of open systems uh, and how to treat correctly the openness of the system uh, when we work out the theory uh, for adiabatic evolution. So let me begin. Uh, so adiabatic algorithms are based on the adiabatic theorem, which states that a slowly varying system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate if it varies slowly compared to the energy gap. So mathematically, uh, systems in a time-dependent system has a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and therefore also the eigenstates and eigenenergies depend on time. So uh, a pictorial, uh, picture to understand the adiabatic theorem is the following. What you see here is the eigenvalues of the system as a function of time. And the statement is the following. If these lines don't cross, that is, if the system is gapped, then if we initialize our system in one of its states, say this green state, and we let it evolve, it is most likely to remain in that state, assuming that the, the energy gap or the distance between the eigenstates is larger than the rate of the change. So that's the theorem. It's very powerful but it is valid for closed systems or for systems that are actually described by a Hermitian Hamiltonian. However, most of the systems that really make up quantum computers are open in the sense that they can exchange energy and particles uh, with our environment. So <clears throat> what's so special about that? Um, so first of all, open systems are not described by Hermitian Hamiltonians. If we want um, a correct treatment of the system's openness, uh, we need a non-Hermitian operator, either an effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian or in other cases, a Lindblad master equation, which is also non-Hermitian. Now, non-Hermitian operators have complex eigenvalues and therefore also the energy gap is complex. So you can immediately um, realize that since the adiabatic theorem relies on the, adiabat uh, on the energy gap being uh, real, if the energy gap is complex, we need to basically modify the adiabatic theorem accordingly. So consequently, open systems behave differently than closed ones. And there is a, a long list of differences. And let me just mention two. So there are cases where adiabatic evolution can fail, even though the system varies slowly compared to the energy gap. That's one thing. And another striking difference relates to cyclic adiabatic processes. These are processes where you take your system and you change it adiabatically from some initial state into you change its parameters, but in the end, you bring back the parameters to the same initial state. And normally in, in Hermitian quantum mechanics, the wave function can pick up a phase, but it will return to itself in the end of the loop. But if the system is open, the, the, the state may change altogether. So today I will focus about two aspects of adiabatic evolution of open systems. In the first part, I'll talk about adiabatic protocols that encircle exceptional points. And I think I'll present, I'll spend most of the time of this talk on, on the first part. And then in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about optimizing adiabatic protocols. All right. So I want to begin by talking about perhaps the simplest um, adiabatic protocol just to um, um, have everybody on the same page. And the simplest adiabatic protocol that I know of uh, is this uh, protocol for adiabatic population transfer between two energy levels of an atom. So an atom can have, it has an um, infinite number of, of energy levels, but we can think about it as a two-level system if we take a field, an electromagnetic field, and we drive transitions between just two of the levels. So a laser-driven two-level atom can be described by this uh, Hamiltonian. So sigma X and Z are Pauli matrices and omega and delta are the frequency and amplitude of the drive. So here's the protocol for adiabatic population transfer. We can just apply a pulse with a chirp. So omega here, the red a curve is the envelope of the field and delta is the frequency of the laser being swept from very negative to very positive or they, from very low to very high uh, through the uh, atomic resonance. So here we have a two by two Hamiltonian, we can plot its eigenvalues. And here are the eigenvalues as a function of time. And you can see that the system is gapped. So if we change omega and delta slowly enough, if we begin in the ground state, we will end up in the ground state. And in this protocol, the ground state changes from zero at the beginning of the protocol to one in the end. So that's why this is an adiabatic protocol for population transfer. And that's the story for a closed system. So now let's see what happens in, in open systems. So we can include the possibility to decay, say from the excited level into 
additional levels, and we can represent this decay rate by some the decay rate by gamma. For example, if we have spontaneous emission or, or other processes through which the atom decays. Uh, under some circumstances, we can describe this with an effective Hamiltonian. So we can uh, introduce an imaginary component to the decaying energy level, and let's see how that affects the eigenstates. So now the eigenstates, the eigenvalues are complex, and let's plot their real part when gamma equals zero, when there's no decay, it's the same problem. But now let us uh, slowly increase the decay rate. And what you see is that the energy levels start approaching each other. And at some critical point, the gap can close. So this is a, a striking difference between a closed system and an open system. Once we introduce loss and we and the loss rate uh, equals to um, the rate of the, the amplitude of the drive, the gap to close. So this expression under the square root vanishes at that point. And this is an exceptional point. Why exceptional? Because the Stube 2 matrix has a single eigenvalue, but also a single eigenvector. It means that we don't have a complete of a, a complete basis of eigenvectors to span the Hilbert space, perturbation theory breaks down. And this is interesting mathematically. But that's not even the end of the story because it's not always valid to use an effective Hamiltonian for open systems. What's more general, so, so basically effective Hamiltonians are valid for weakly decaying systems, but a more general treatment is the Lindblad master equation. So if all we know is that our quantum system is in contact with a bath and a bath is Markovian, we can write down the Lindblad master equation for the density matrix that describes the, the state of the system. It has a Hermitian Hamiltonian term and some quantum John term. All right, and we may, may ask the same question. Say we uh, drive our system with a uh, pulse with a chirp and there is some dissipation uh, to the bath. What are the exceptional points of the system and how does it behave? So the mathematical treatment of Lindblad equation is slightly more complicated, but for a two-level system, one can um, describe the dynamics by uh, basically introducing the block vector, a three-dimensional vector that represents the state of the system. And basically it evolves the, the operator that governs the dynamic is a generalization of, of the Hamiltonian. It's an operator that depends on the parameters of the laser, omega and delta again, and the dissipation rate. And with that, having uh, this upper, this description in mind, we can ask what are the eigenvalues of the effective Hamiltonian and of the um, block operator, and do they behave basically the same? So what we plot here, the effective Hamiltonian is a two by two matrix. We have two eigenstates. Uh, the block vector has three eigenstates. So this line here is the steady state. And now let's see what happens when we introduce, so the blue line corresponds to no decay, but now let's introduce decay and see what happens. So once we, again, we see that also in the block vector description, the gap closes. But very interestingly, it closes at a different point. And another way to look at it is the following. We can basically now um, look at the effective Hamiltonian and the operator M as operators that depend on parameters. For, for a fixed decay rate, uh, they depend only on the detuning and, and radio frequency. And we can ask ourselves, when does the gap close? So what you see in these pictures on the bottom, uh, we plot the, the magnitude of the gap. So black color shows a gap closing point, in this case, an exceptional point. And you see that while the effective Hamiltonian has two points, when omega equals plus minus gamma, this operator M has uh, a bow tie shape of exceptional lines. It was uh, shown by Ronnie Kozlo, who's sitting in the audience in the Amshalem, and also studied by Kater Murch and others. So this was already observed. And it's very interesting that um, descriptions that uh, pe people frequently use um, for open two-level systems behave so differently in terms of the exceptional points. So um, we wanted to, to, to study the geometry of exceptional lines in a a system that we could actually drive and measure, measure. And the system we chose is in V centers. This work was done in collaboration with uh, the lab of Neil Belgil in the Hebrew University. He has NV centers, defects in the diamond lattice. Basically, the, the NV center consists of a substitutional nitrogen atom and a vacancy, and the electrons um, get, get uh, localized in the vacancy, and this defect acts as an artificial atom. So the energy levels of this defect are well known, the ground states are spin triplet states, and you can drive transitions between them with microwave fields, and there are known decay mechanisms induced by the, by the bath, by the environment. So 
we uh, analyzed the geometry of exceptional lines for NV centers, we were able to prove some things. For example, if you only drive transitions between two of the levels, you can only get a bow tie a shape of EP lines. You will never get exceptional isolated points. That's the only thing you can get. But if you want to induce isolated points, you have to drive transitions into a third level. And we were interested in these isolated points. So that's an example for, for um, how we, we um, basically found the parameters that give you isolated points. And I'll show you soon why we wanted that. So what? So this work was done in 2018, but now we're working on experimental verification of, of this result. So basically we have some predictions about the EP geometry and we can measure it. We measure a populations, electronic population in, in the states and their time evolution by doing a Ramsey type experiment. And we can extract the eigenvalues of the Lindblad master equation and see what we get. So these are some preliminary results. We still don't see the, the triangle, but we hope we will. What else? So we're also working on generalizing this results. So we would like to classify in general, what are the geometries of, of the EP lines that we will get in multi-level, multi-qubit systems. So here you see an example of two interacting Rydberg qubits. So Rydberg qubits are again, two level systems that have a low energy state and then a very highly excited energy state and that is associated with a very large dipole moment. So two Rydberg atoms interact much more strongly in the excited state than in the ground state. And when these atoms are placed far apart, each one of them has this bow tie a shape of degeneracies. But now when they interact, a, when the interaction is weak, we get these, um, the bow type is tripled. And as the interaction strength between the Rydberg qubits exceeds the Rabi drive, we start seeing these exceptional lines, uh, these exceptional points. And uh, this is work in progress. So why do we care about these exceptional points at all? So we care about them in the context of adiabatic protocols. And adiabatic protocol requires a gap and um, gap closing points are important for various reasons. And let me show you one of them. So let's talk a bit, a, a bit about cyclic adi adiabatic protocols and how they behave near exceptional points. So first, uh, what is a cyclic adiabatic protocol? So let's consider again our driven two-level system and now change the parameters omega and delta along a loop in parameter space. So if this loop does not include any degeneracy and the system here is, is even closed, the energy surfaces uh, near this um, loop look something like that. And if I just perform a loop, I initialize my system in one of its states and change the parameters in a cyclic manner, the wave function will return to itself. However, if we consider an open system with an exceptional point, like this open system with the decay that we had on the previous page, the exceptional points looks like a twist in the energy surfaces or the Riemann surfaces. And if we initialize our system on one of its states and we perform a loop, we will end up in the other manifold and we have to encircle it twice to get back to the original state. That's not even the end of the story. So that's the story for the instantaneous eigenstates. Uh, if we look at the dynamic evolution, one can show that if the system can evolve adiabatically, if we go in a clockwise manner, then it cannot evolve adiabatically in a counterclockwise manner. It's called the chiral adiabatic condition. And it was also introduced and studied by, by several groups. What we wanted to do is we wanted to demonstrate this with NV center qubits. So as I showed on the previous slide, we found this isolated point, we could encircle it. What you see here is the energy surfaces around this exceptional point in this three level system. It's a three level system. The density matrix is a three by three matrix, but traces one. So we have eight degrees of freedom, eight energy surfaces. We have our twist. We could um, simulate the equations numerically and we could demonstrate this chiral adiabatic uh, switch. That's great. We also wanted to measure it, but we uh, couldn't because our signal decayed too much. Basically all the system, the signal decohered. And we actually encountered a channel, a challenge, and that is an inherent challenge. There's a trade-off between maintaining coherence and maintaining adiabaticity. If you wanna be adiabatic, you need to go slowly. But if you want to maintain coherence, you need to do things quickly enough um, compared to the lifetime, the coherence lifetime. So. We encountered this challenge if we just did a naive loop, but uh, now we know that we can actually improve this. We can find optimal trajectories. This is work in progress that I will not talk about, but in the time that remains, uh, I will 
say that we can improve the performance with optimization, and I will move on and talk about optimizing adiabatic protocols. So this brings me to the second part of the talk uh, about finding optimal pulses for adiabatic quantum computation. So usually in adiabatic quantum computation, we actually want to be far away from exceptional points. We want to gap systems. Um, now, the advantage of adiabatic protocols it, is that they are robust. Um, the, it, for example, in encircling an exceptional point, it doesn't really matter how I encircle it. It matters that I encircle it. So the details of the protocol many times don't matter. So they're robust to certain types of errors. But adiabaticity requires going slowly. So the question is, how can we find protocols that are as robust as adiabatic, but faster? So I will show um, two approaches that we took to, to address this challenge. So the first thing I want to present is something called inertial control. So the idea of this work was motivated by work done by Roy, Dan, and Wani Kozlov from the Hebrew University. Um, they introduced this paper um, that they called the inertial theorem, and this is the idea. So given a time-dependent system, any time-dependent system, one can search for a new basis where the dynamics is slow. So this is kind of similar to a rotating frame where you take a time-dependent system and you change the basis and in the new basis, the system is slow. If the dynamics of, is in the new basis is adiabatic, the system will get to the desired final state robustly also in the lab frame. So that's the idea. It's a little abstract. So let me give a concrete example also from their paper. And that is a, once again, our driven two level system, but now Delta and Omega don't need to vary slowly. So here the Hamiltonian is written in this Pauli basis of operator, operators, sigma X and sigma Z. But we can introduce a new basis, a, which contains the operator H and two operators L and C, which are in some sense orthogonal to the Hamiltonian H. And we can write down the equations of motion for these operators using the Heisenberg equation of motion. And what you see is that we get this operator equation. So mu and theta are parameters defined on the right. Theta is the magnitude of uh, delta and omega squared. And mu is essentially the adiabaticity parameter. It is the rate of change of the parameters divided by the magnitude of the energy gap. So in an adiabatic protocol, mu needs to be small. But in order to be adiabatic in, in this rotated basis, all we need is mu for mu to vary slowly. So computationally, this could be an advantage if we don't have to require that the fields vary slowly, only that the variation of the variation will be slow. Or in other words, we don't restrict the velocity, but we restrict the acceleration. So this sounded like a promising idea, and we wanted to basically take this inertial theorem and find inertial protocols for quantum computation. How am I doing with time? Do I have two more minutes? I can't hear you. Do I have two more minutes? Not sure. How many minutes do I have? Two? Uh, sure, yeah, please go ahead. I have two minutes? Yes. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So, uh, so I will explain how we um, found inertial a single qubit gates, and this will be the last thing that I will show in two minutes. All right, so our goal was to improve, oops, sorry. I, our goal was to improve adiabatic protocols for quantum logic gates, a, and the gates we chose to improve, to, to improve are called adiabatic geometric gates. So it's a cyclic adiabatic process where the wave function during the process acquires a geometric phase and that phase that dictates what unitary operation uh, will be performed on the qubit. So let me just give uh, an example. Uh, so this example was first worked out by, by this group of authors and they showed the following thing. So, so we have uh, a tripod, a four level atomic system the states zero and one encode the, the qubit, and the sta states two and E are auxiliary modes. And what we want to do, we want to apply a, a sequence of, of pulses in order to make the qubit state undergo some unitary. And here's the idea. What you do is the following thing. You do a diabatic population transfer out of the qubit space and back into the qubit space. But when you go back into the qubit state, you go in a different way. And in that way, that the qubit state acquires a geometric phase. 
I'll go kind of quickly over this, but here's here's the protocol, the original protocol, and then I'll say a word about how we improved it. So the original protocol is this, in order to transfer population out of the qubit state, we actually take the population out of one into two with a stirrup stage, we apply these pulses, omega two and omega one, and then we retrieve population from two to one by applying once again, omega one and omega two, but we shift the phase of the second field. And in this way, the, the qubit state acquires a phase. So the standard approach is to apply adiabatic pulses. What we did is we found pulse shapes for omega one and omega two that are not adiabatic, but they are inertial. And in this way, we improve the performance. So I'll just show the results and then I'll skip to the end. So what you see here in this upper plot is that we can achieve, I'll skip the details, that we can achieve um, a lower gate error for the same protocol duration. So in that sense, so our result is this, our inertial protocol is this red curve and we compare it to some standard adiabatic pulses. And then we can further improve this result with optimal control. And what we see in the lower plot is that our results are also robust. So we perturb the laser frequencies from atomic resonance and we check by how much the fidelity, the gate fidelity degrades. And we see that our red pulses, uh, the, the gate fidelity remains pretty high, even if we detune the frequency by 30 megahertz from, from the optimal point. So we showed an implementation with rubidium atoms and I think I ran out of time. So I'll just mention that we're also working on developing software, quantum optimal control software that is specifically suited for improving adiabatic algorithms. And we do this uh, by basically looking for pulses that are optimally adiabatic in the sense that the projection of the simulated state on the instantaneous eigenstate is as, as um, large as possible. The, the overlap is as large as possible. So we do this, and in this way, we can find pulses that are fast and robust. And I'll maybe, if I can take one more minute, I will say where we want to go with this. So all of the examples that I showed here were basically for a diabetic um, population transfer in a two and a three level system, but, it, but we're actually also working on a diabetic optimization of multi-qubit problems. A, for example, we're developing algorithms for solving graph problems on Rydberg atom arrays. That's our main interest right now. And we're also working on understanding the complexity of these super adiabatic algorithms. So complexity of adiabatic algorithms is a very uh, well-studied field, but the understanding the complexity of shortcuts to adiabaticity is a little bit less explored, and that's our a main interest. I just want to conclude by thanking the people who did this work. So, um, Awani Kozov and uh, Boydan, I credited along the way on the inertial theorem. And uh, this work was also done mainly by the student, Daniel, and our collaborator from the Weizmann Institute, Barak Dayan. Um, and uh, here, these guys are our collaborators on the exceptional points work. Thank you very much for listening. And um, that's it.